Right. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about a kind of very interesting moment, interesting to me, in Italian uh, political discourse, and that's about um, where the genre of the Western was taken up in the 60s and 70s by um, some politically radical directors to try to promote kind of anarchist, Marxist, and uh, occasionally social democratic messages. Uh, over the past few years, I've been interested in how constructions of the Bible, Christianity, Judaism, and religion have changed over the past 50 years in English political discourse. Today, though, I, uh, I want to take this one aspect of Italian takes on socialist understandings of religion and the Bible, which seems quite different from my usual interest in English politics, in that the, in Italian uh, political discourse on the Bible, the role of violence, um, or even the reactions against it, a, a, a very significant and very central, uh, fashioned in light of Gramsci, Fanon, uh, the recent fan fascist past, colonial uprisings, and so on. Uh, one particular manifestation was the then notoriously violent Italian or spaghetti westerns of the 60s and 70s. And while a number of radical socialists wrote and directed these films, they are most famously represented in the UK and North America by Sergio Leone, who I think also represents a key moment in redirecting the radicalness towards neoliberalism. Now, um, even if someone has not somehow not seen Sergio Leone's westerns, the poncho-wearing, cigar-smoking, gun-toting, stubble-growing image of its breakout star Clint Eastwood, as well as the distinctive Ennio Morricone soundtracks, may still provoke some kind of recognition. For those unfamiliar with Leone's westerns, the key films include the Dollars trilogy, just full of dollars, a few dollars more, the good, the bad and the ugly, and Once Upon a Time in the West. The Dollars trilogy involves quests for money and focuses mainly on Clint Eastwood's bounty hunter, or bounty killer character, often referred to as the man with no name, though in each film he actually has a different name. Uh, Once Upon a Time in the West shifts the focus to another dangerous figure, just called Harmonica, played by Charles Bronson, but he ultimately gives way to Jill McBain, played by Claudia Cardinale, a non-violent former prostitute who becomes the mother, in inverted commas, of the new town of Sweetwater, and that's how it ends. As Christopher Frayling, probably the most influential analyst of Leone, would detail, Leone's westerns were also a critical commentary on the American western, transforming the optimistic view of the frontier into a world of death and corruption, to which I would add that all, the all-pervasive death functions as a means of unleashing revolutionary change, whether from the right or the left. One of the oldest questions, and once upon a time, once the most popular question in the critical study of Leone's westerns was, as Frayling put it, why did the moment of the Italian westerns appeal so much to the children of Marx and Coca-Cola in Europe, especially the generation of May 1968, to which I think we should extend the geography to include North America uh, and widen the time frame to include its ongoing reception to the present. Leone's westerns can be read as simultaneously celebrating and critiquing capitalism and Hollywood westerns, and that such tensions have always surrounded their various receptions, including, for what it's worth, Leone's own understandings of himself. Eastwood's anti-authority character and distinctive style in the, the Leone westerns seem to have resonated with the social changes of the 60s and the stylistic statements of the associated Vietnam protests. Yet this individualistic gunslinger with little time for bureaucracy is not too far removed from figures in other films which would soon pick up on various Western themes and which represent the next stage in the development of the Eastwood and Bronson personas. Uh, I'm thinking here of uh, Clint Eastwood in Dirty Harry and uh, Bronson in, uh, Bronson's role as in Michael Winner's Death Wish, both films representing a very firm shift to the right and a reaction against the perceived progressive politics of the 1960s. There are many ways we can try to understand the popularity and survival of Leone's westerns. One, and, and only one, is to look at their ideological fit, if that's the right phrase, with changes happening in Europe and North America since the 1960s. And I'm thinking here again, a term used regularly in this conference, neoliberalism and the emergence of. 
The timing in, uh, of the marketable and pop image, pop art image of the recognisable Eastwood persona that emerged from the Dollars trilogy, and which Eastwood was very keen to protect, is crucial because of the instant image and PR would become a defining feature of neoliberal or postmodern capitalism from the 60s onwards. More broadly, leftist criticisms of traditional forms of authority, alongside a sustained critique of the dominance of Marxist meta-narratives, were also significant for understanding the emergence of neoliberalism, of course. In a prime example of the law of unintended consequences, the rhetoric of freedom, liberty, individuality, and challenges to the role of the state, which came out of the 60s, would be appropriated by the right, albeit in economic terms, and adapted in many parts of popular culture in the Reaganization or Thatcherization of media, journalism, universities, economics, and politics. The values associated with Leone's protagonists are sometimes compatible with, though sometimes critical of, the dominant values that have since become associated with neoliberalism. Leone's amoral and seemingly unconstrained entrepreneurial bounty killers are, after all, obsessed with accumulating a personal fortune. But, uh, and there's a terrific book on this by Austin Fisher, uh, the Italian Westerns of the 1960s were also engaged in radical left-wing political debates, from violent revolution through to the rise of fascism to multi-ethnic communes pitted against vigilantes and the sheriff, and the need to kill off plenty of these kind of proto-Ku Klux Klanners. You get this, in, for instance, in Face to Face. There's a, you don't get this in Leone at all. You get... Uh, Sort of multi-ethnic, uh, mixed-gender, hillbilly communes fighting against fascism in the hills. I mean, very explicit. Uh, this political engagement, though, includes Leone's westerns as well. Basic influences can be seen in the uh, in the critique of corporate greed in Once Upon a Time in the West, the classic image of the railroad boss, for instance, and the relative. Uh, relatively sympathetic treatment of bandits as symptoms of social economic circumstances. And for those of you who watch the films, Tuco in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, who can gain popular support in small rural towns. Even the, even the very nasty bandits are supported by the peasantry. But Leone's westerns were not radical enough for some. Uh, the Italian actor Jean Maria Volante, this guy, uh, who played the roles of Ramon and Indio in Fistful of Dollars and a Few Dollars More, respectively, was a Communist Party member who, despite his prominence in Leone's Westerns um, and growing fame, turned down uh, a main role in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly because he wanted to take on more significant political roles. These were just not left-wing enough for him. And Volante, I think, had a point, as the political critique in Leone is largely muted. Uh, when Leone gets to his uh, more cynical um, work called Duck You Sucker or A Fistful of Dynamite in 1971, which is on the Mexican Revolution, the political critique is levelled more at the intellectual concepts of revolution, post-68 disillusionment, and attacks on the Italian westerns of the revolutionary Zapata variety. Though the film is hardly unsympathetic and puts class distinction in sharp focus and adds degrees of chaos and complexity to understanding revolutionary commitments and attitudes. Okay, I want to talk next about the, what I, in Leone's films, what I call the first transformative stage of capitalism. The political mark of the Italian Western runs deep in Leone's Westerns. It's still there, without doubt. Taken collectively, they provide a materialist explanation of the origins of American capitalism, which further helps us understand their political ambiguities. There are effectively two transformational stages of capitalism in Leone's Westerns, which I think resonated with the tensions leading up to the emergence of neoliberalism. In the Dollars Trilogy, uh, we have this represented, the first stage of transformative capitalism is where death and chaos rule. In this stage, the deceitful, untrustworthy, morbidly entrepreneurial masters of all the new uh, violent technologies thrive, latching on to death as a commodity and wiping out the lingering feudalism of the rival families in A Fistful of Dollars or the outdated peasantry and peasant technology at the beginning of The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, which just has a peasant boy endlessly circling a well on a mule, soon to be overpowered by the solitary killer and his gun. 
Unlike the two opposing families in Fistful of Dollars, Eastwood's character can move freely across boundaries and sells his services to both sides. As Timothy Campbell argues, Eastwood here comes to stand in for te a technological form linked to the mode of postmodern capitalism in which circulation of bodies, objects and labour power is key. But once the macabre market has dried up, Eastwood's character moves on to make more money from death elsewhere in a world increasingly suited to his particular talents. At the beginning of For a Few Dollars More, the follow-up film, we get the explanation to the audience that the reason for the bounty killers was that life may not have value, but death sometimes has a price. The seemingly, uh, seeming uh, appealing disregard for traditional authority by the main characters is a marked feature of Leone's first transformative stage of capitalism and represented by the Dollars Trilogy. Paralleling the overturning of the lingering feudalism, the state, government and local authority are not only corrupt or outdated, but are constantly undermined, used or humiliated by a form of individualism represented by Leone's main characters. In this stage, the corrupt sheriff is no longer loyal, courageous and especially honest, as Lee Eastwood points out in A Few Dollars More. With no other authority than his own, Eastwood can remove the sheriff's badge and toss it away with impunity. But traditional authorities are not simply involved in petty corruption. The northern prison camp can be used by the great western baddie, the greatest of them all, Lee Van Cleef, to carry out torture in his pursuit of Carson's gold. Indeed, we might say that the bigger the authority in the films, the more destructive and more indifferent to suffering it can be. Even to the point where it disgusts Eastwood's character in the final of the Dollars Trilogy. Alongside money and the pervasiveness of death, a very typical theme in the Italian Western generally, Christianity is one of the most prominent discourses which illuminate this first transformative stage of capitalism. Now, much more can be and, and I have uh, can be added on the pervasiveness of death, but it should be obvious enough anyway, I think, to anyone who's seen them. And in striking contrast to um, uh, American Westerns, Leone's representation of Christianity is almost always Catholic and Latin rather than Protestant and white. And you just get a hint of this in some of these buildings, um, but the, Google didn't have enough pictures, I'm afraid. Um, and, as long as, and, it's, and the representation is typically a profaned version of Christianity in this period of Leone's historical schema where death knows no boundaries. The normative family structure for Leone is presented in terms of the Holy Family, particularly in Fistful of Dollars and a Few Dollars More, and is either uprooted or its members murdered. Throughout the films, a desacralised Christian imagery is clear enough in rowdy Last Supper scenes, broken statues, disused and ramshackle crosses, crumbling churches, churches as bandit hideouts, and ominous church bells. The main characters are presented in similarly ironic ways. You get bandits preaching a parable, his term, from the pulpit about robbing the bank of El Paso. You get bounty killer dressed up as a priest reading the Bible. Eastwood, the trickster, is a golden-haired angel. And there are various trickster Judases which is as much a compliment as an insult in a world where betrayal and trickery in pursuit of money are the closest things to virtues. In this profaned world, resurrection plays a transformative role for at least three of Leone's lead characters, which leads to the, uh, the ultimate deaths and the ultimate prize. In Fistful of Dollars, for instance, Eastwood escapes in a coffin, nearly dead, complete with a shut lid and a few seconds of black screen, followed by his resurrection in, of course, a cave. The new Eastwood dramatically returns seemingly immortal thanks to the trickery of his protective metal vest. But this profanation of Christianity is grotesque, macabre, macho and something integral to the pursuit of money and transformation of the world of the American Western is part of a world that also gets transformed in Leone's schema in order to hasten the development of American, modern American capitalism. And that's why the next stage, the second stage of transformative, second transformative stage of capitalism is important. While Once Upon a Time in the West continues Leone's critical engagement with the American Western, he would now incorporate his Dollars trilogy as part of his critique uh, in what is the second transformative stage of capitalism for Leone. 
At this point in Leone's story, the age of the gunslinger is coming to an end as they die off or leave the boom town. By the end, it's Jill McBain, the mother of Sweetwater, who now represents the American future. The gunslingers had their uses in protecting her from the remaining ravages of uh, the first stage of capitalism, but it's the investment in building materials for a strategically located town that guarantees its long-term future. The second transformative stage of capitalism in Once Upon a Time in the West involves a shift to a different form of capitalism. In sharp contrast to the Dollars Trilogy, financial gain is not a primary motivation for the gunslingers in Once Upon a Time in the West. By the end of the film, the successful use of money is now associated with investment and the emerging business class. Death is now controlled and regulated once again as the wiping out of the old world and its values are complete. The killers defend and aid McBain in her development of Sweetwater before their departure from the historical stage. And now we get the development of the railroad, a staple of the American Western, which picks up on conventional Western uh, themes, but now with a Leone spin. This new technological advance brings death, whether in troops or criminals in, the, in Good, the Bad and the Ugly, bounty killers in for a few dollars more, or the gang of killers in Once Upon a Time in the West. But once the railroad is in place and Jill McBain has taken control of water and labour, the development of the railroad becomes domesticated uh, in the next stage of capitalism as the old killers are all removed. Already, in Once Upon a Time in the West, the trains bring or will bring commerce. They bring Jill McBain. And they bring different ethnic groups, including Native Americans, who are conspicuous by their absence in every other aspect of Leone's Westerns. As Leone himself implied, this harnessing of a more ethnically diverse community and labour force is part of the construction of new boundaries, new towns in this stage of capitalist development. A recircularised Christianity is also found in Once Upon a Time in the West, especially in the forgotten plans for a church within the town. The profaned Christian imagery of the era of the bounty killer and gunslinger continues, but by the time uh, Jill McBain secures the train station and guarantees the future of Sweetwater at the end of the film, murdering angels, resurrected killers, trickster Judases are dead, long gone, or in the process of being carried out of town. Gone to are the decaying statues and crooked crosses. The construction of this uh, desacralized religion is now associated with a bygone era, either in its decline or, as in, or in a time when, as Tuco pointed out to his brother amidst crumbling statues, you either become a bandit or a priest. And of course, being a priest is the easy option. But once upon a time in the West, religion is now controlled, put in its place, though interestingly, not obviously Catholic. At a push, it might be argued that uh, McBain picks up on the Holy Mother and Holy, uh, Holy Mother and Whore tropes that have been associated with the two most famous Marys in the New Testament and in some aspects of Catholic tradition. And Leone certainly had interested Holy Family in imagery. But what we see at the end in Sweetwater uh, could be a town, any town, from the Hollywood mainstream rather than a distinctly Leone one. But whatever we make of it, denominationally, the church is now domesticated and, as the gunslingers discovered, put in its place alongside the post office, corral and water tank in the rediscovered and now implemented plans for the building of the town. So one final point on a different kind of revolution at stake here. A culmination of a Marxian reading of history, though it may be, once upon a time in the West still ends optimistically and is hardly an overt condemnation of American capitalism found in other Italian Westerns. The Dollars Trilogy may well have turned the world of the American Western upside down, they may have linked capital with the forces of death, and they may have challenged traditional forms of authority and community in a way that would be appealing in the 60s and to 60s counterculture. But Leone's second transformative stage of capitalism showcases the values of amoral capitalism, untrustworthiness, and a certain form of individualism, which are uh, hardly alien to the emerging neoliberalism. It is also perhaps significant that the optimistic and initially heavily edited Once Upon a Time in the West was not the immediate success of the Dollars Trilogy, and it was not until Vietnam was comfortably in the past and Reaganism was firmly in the ascendancy that its reputation as a cinematic classic began to develop, and with an extended version released in 1984. 
And by the time of the Westerns of Leone and Italian cinema were being showcased now through the relentless borrowing, as Leone himself had done, from the 1990s on, onwards, the radical leftist element of the violence was now largely drained, although there is a case that Tarantino's Django Unchained intensifies the critique of the racist heritage. Nevertheless, uh, we might contrast two of the most obviously political Italian Westerns of the time, A Bullet for the General and Requiescat. Both films cover similar themes of death, as all Italian Westerns do, revenge, money and religion, and have considerably more prominent female roles among the fighters and revolutionaries that would ever be found in a Leone film. In fact, Leone films, you, you, the case is fairly strong that he's borderline misogynist. Um, weirdly, I couldn't find too many pictures, but you get the... the uh, some of the, the end of the films, you get the, the bandit groups are pretty much 50-50 gender-wise as they go off to fight for the revolution. Both films deal with the development uh, of a country, but this time, Mexico, and the way that American involvement in capitalism, as well as the Mexican government and landowners, play their part. As the films side firmly with the peasants uh, and against Leone, these films use death to further the revolutionary cause. Money is now associated with corrupt capitalists, or was associated with corrupt capitalists, and imperialists, rather than any virtue. In both films, there is an element of Christianity profaned through violence, crucifixion on a railway line, for instance, or a capitalist landowner comparing himself with the God of the Bible. But Christianity can use violence for revolutionary good. The idealistic heart of both films are revolutionary priests. Santo, Klaus Kinski there, and of course, Pasolini in Requiescan. Um, and in Bullet for the General, Santo is the most hardened of revolutionaries, almost blindly loyal to the cause, who believes that stolen weapons are being used for God's work. He tells another priest that Christ sided with the poor and downtrodden and died between two bandits, and so a, and so a good priest should be a violent revolutionary. He grenades the military in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and ends his grenading with an amen. And in place of poor prisoners, he puts their captors in a prison cell, telling them they will die slowly, where they can take time to think about forgiveness of sins. Santo too asks for forgiveness for shedding blood, but he says it's necessary for the revolution. In Requiescan, this film of the same name uh, follows a, a familiar path of developing political awareness, but the Bible itself is on this path. He's brought up by a non-violent preacher, embarks on a mission to find his half-sister, with the Bible, both physically and in quotation, always justifying his actions, always accompanying him in his fights, and even protects him from a bullet. But it takes the commentary of Pasolini, beginning with the Bible landing at his feet, to reveal the Bible's full revolutionary potential. Pasolini's character claims, this is the book that will bring people freedom. And in sharp contrast to Leone's characters, um, Pasolini's denounces individualist revenge and enjoyment of violence. Instead, Pasolini claims that violence is um, uh, an unfortunate necessity in order to fight the capitalists and landowners of this world who will steal land, and it will bring us justice and liberty. The endings of both films make for sharp contrast with Once Upon a Time in the West, Rather than the backdrop of a boom town of Sweetwater, we get peasants tilling the land as a group of freedom fighters, men and women, ride off to fight for the cause. Or in the case of a bullet for the general, the gringo assassin of the revolutionary leader is shot dead and sent packing on a train backed to the land where they put a price on everything, America. By once upon a time in the West, Leone had become enamoured with the romance of the American West before moving on to a jaded view of revolution in Duck You Sucker. Nevertheless, revolutionary Christianity is not entirely overturned in Leone's deconstruction of the, Z uh, the Zapata Western, and James Corburn's character returns the cross that he had previously ripped off from the peasant's neck and gives it him as the new revolutionary general in the making. But once upon a time, this West was full of radicals. But unlike, but like, or partly because of, Leone's overarching narrative, they've become a thing of the distant past. Leone's westerns are heavy on individualism and freedom, but little on community. 
little on the need for revolution or sustained anti-capitalism, all multi-ethnic, multi-gendered, multi-gendered? Well, you work out that, if you will, uh, com uh, communes beyond the vigilante and the sheriff. But if ever there were a time in recent decades for a return to a more radical past, one that goes beyond contemporary Hollywood in its critique of bad capitalism in the name of good capitalism, is it not now, as the validity of the assumptions of neoliberalism are being challenged like never before since the 2008 crash? And I'll leave you with uh, the answer that they have in fact been challenged by a group I've been studying, but I'm not going to talk about here. And this is the Bob Crow Brigade, uh, English, Scottish and Irish revolutionaries who have gone out uh, in the past few years among the anarchists and Marxists to fight for the social, uh, social, socialist and feminist revolution against ISIS in Rojava in northern Syria and their Corbyn supporters, as I'm sure you uh, were aware. And where death is relentlessly reinterpreted in terms of revolutionary potential as a means of smashing through neoliberalism and left melancholia. I'll leave it there. <laughs>